burning, but you won't see it on my face. Watch me. Dance. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Crazy dance party in the morning, I guess. Well, it's noon where I am, but wherever you are, um, I hope you are excited to be here with us. I see that we have some first timers here. That's awesome. Yeah, all the emojis flying. So good, so happy to have you all here. Uh, introducing your clicked coach, we have here with us today, Miss Azel. Uh, Azel, would you like to talk a little bit about your background? Introduce yourself. Sure, uh, I was just seeing that all my captions and stuff are in French, I don't know why, but anyways, um, here we are. Hi everyone, I am Azel, I'm based in Cape Town, South Africa, and I'm the architecture practice lead at a sales source partner called Blue Sky. And I've been in the ecosystem for about six, coming on seven years now. And um, I was also a career changer. I was a social worker in my previous life. And so that's why I'm very happy to be part of the Click community um, and be a part of this. So yeah, that's a bit about me. Awesome, great start. All right, here's our agenda, guys. I'm gonna go over the overview a little bit. Um, we will get into the topic discussion. Then there's going to be time for some Q&A. If you have any questions that you would like asked um, and answered, uh, feel free to put those in the Q&A bar on the side. Sometimes when you put them in the chat, they get lost. So if you have a dying question, uh, make sure it makes that into the Q&A box. Here are our core clicked principles. We are here to learn from each other. Um, I know that this one is a shadow session, so we're mostly just gonna be following along. But in general, we'd like this to be a safe place to try, to try something new, to learn something new. Uh, and we're here to have fun. So that's what we're all about here at Clicked. What is a shadow session? So this is a one hour ride along where we're gonna watch Azelle work through a popular Salesforce topic. Um, no need to participate in terms of, of building something out on your end, but uh, what I would recommend is to follow along here with us, ask the questions that you have, and then these sessions are recorded so you can go back and watch it again. And so if you wanna try to build along or um, play along, you can do that as well on your own time. Uh, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box. So let's talk about SQL. Is that how you pronounce that, Azelle? Let's see where she went. Azelle, are you there? Oh no, we've lost her. Okay, we will get Azelle back up here. Uh, Pranati says yes. So. Um, did the broadcast only begin 20 seconds ago? Um, I thought I, I started it a few minutes ago, but you haven't missed anything, Andrea, so don't worry. Um, it's good to see you guys too. Akela, it's good to see you again. Um, I'm gonna see if we can get Azelle back up here. I think she, yeah, okay. Sorry, sorry. That's okay. All right, uh, we didn't miss anything. So um, am I pronouncing that correctly? Is it Sockwell? Yes, Sockwell, that's right. <laughs> And just a brief overview, what would you like everyone to know? Yeah, um, sorry uh, for turning off my camera, folks, and my network isn't too good. So just shout or Taylor give me a nudge if I break up again. Um, and apologies, swiping the camera off today. I'll see if it improves and I'll turn it back on. But yeah, so there's quite a bit to know about this very interesting topic, um, but it is a fundamental concept for an admin, for a developer, an architect, for anyone aspiring to do anything in Salesforce. It's even in the day-to-day -day of end users, even though they might not know it. Um, so I'll say that before we get into the meat of, of what it is and, and how we're going to use it. All right. Well, with that, we can get started. So I will stop sharing my screen so that if you'd like to share yours, you can. Um, and we'll get into it. Fantastic. Thanks, Taylor. All right, folks, um, maybe we can do a quick show of hands by emoji. So can you put up a thumbs up if you know what SQL is? All right, quite a few. And can you give me a wow if you don't know what SQL is? Okay, a few of you too. That's great. That's fine. It's always nice to learn something new. Hopefully everyone could learn something today. 
Um, right, so so let's jump in. Just before I, uh, actually, I'm going to start sharing my screen um, just to get that going. But I'm going to try. Oh, it's in French. <laughs> oh, no, don't worry. I, I, I can deal with this. Um, there we go. Okay. So while this is coming up, okay, good. Um, I would highly recommend before we get started that you check out the Sockle for Admins module on Trailhead. A lot of the things that I'll cover here is, is also covered there with some hands-on exercises. Um, and I think there are some follow-on trails that's a bit more complex if you go into the development side of things. But this is a great place to start. Um, don't be intimidated by <laughs> the unfamiliar language or reference to Apex or all of that sort of things. It's very helpful to go along, and you'll see that even within the um, in the uh, units themselves, they often have like these follow along videos. So I definitely recommend if you haven't done this before, take a look at it. It's very useful. Um, and then, yeah, just going back to uh, today. So a lot of you already know what Sockle is. Some of you don't. And so some of you might have heard of SQL as well before, even if you don't know exactly what it is. But SQL itself is structured query language, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's structured query language. And it allows you to basically get information, filter information, aggregate information from a relational database. And as you probably know from this, at this point in your journey, Salesforce is also a relational database. And so is something like Excel, for example, as well. So um, that is SQL and a lot of data scientists or uh, other professionals use SQL on a day-to-day -day basis to query information from various different databases. Now in Salesforce, since we also have a relational database, but we have a bit of our own spin on things, um, we have a similar acronym called SQL, but it's a bit different. It stands for Salesforce Object Query Language. Um, so I do want to ask questions, but I know it's maybe not the most effective, time effective. Um, yeah, I think right now, a hard sorry, what's that? No, I said, I think right now we're, um, we're good. Uh, I did put that link to the trailhead in the chat for you. Oh, perfect. Thanks so much. Cool. Um, okay. So give me a heart emoji. If you're very comfortable with the concept of a sales source object. Nice, nice. And give me the sunglasses if you're not always too sure. <laughs> OK. Oh, no, Azelle. <laughs> I think we've lost you again. Um, I lost your screen, at least. We'll see if we can get Azelle back up here. She's got some connection issues today. So um, hopefully we can we can get her back up here to discuss. In the meantime, I will answer some of the questions in the Q&A. Um, we've got Megan asking about um, not having access to a Salesforce account uh, using Trailhead. So uh, what you can do is you can always sign up for a free dev org and get your hands in there to play around. And then sign up for as many clicked experiences as you can. Um, whatever you see that seems exciting or interesting to you, if you want to see which career path you want to go down, we have ones for VA and ones for admin, um, as well as all of these learning experiences that we offer um, that would be applicable to everyone. So I highly recommend that you head over to our website and check out and see which, um, which experiences you'd like to sign up for there. Um, and then uh, let's see what else we've got. Oh, Azelle's back. Sorry, folks. <laughs> I switched networks now, so we should be okay. good. Sorry about that. Hopefully yeah. that was a long time. Um, all right. So what I was just saying is there's a couple of people who are very comfortable with what Salesforce object is, and some of you maybe not so much. So I'll just go over it quickly. And if anyone wants to um, 
want to pop in the chat their version, their uh, their own words of what the, the object is, um, do so and, and then we can compare a little bit. But yeah, a Salesforce object essentially, the way that I, I always refer to it is a entity about which you want to collect information. So it, contact or account is always a good one to take as an example. You have people um, that you want to collect information about. So a contact is an object in Salesforce or a table is what it's often other times called in other databases. And then um, we also have uh, essentially you can refer to it or related to an Excel workbook or a Google Sheets um, document where the object essentially is the tab. Um, and then you have rows, which are records and columns, which are fields. So hopefully that helps a little bit, um, but we won't go into too much detail about that today. So what we're talking about with Salesforce object query language, it allows us to actually execute queries against our Salesforce instance and get certain information back that um, we want to see. And so where do we use um, SQL, object, um, SQL queries? Uh, everywhere is the answer essentially. So the first place where you all might be familiar with it is in reports, right? Um, so let me see if I can have, I'm just in a, a Salesforce playground right now. So um, I'll see if I can open up just a, a okay, I'm just gonna open a sample report. There's probably not gonna be anything here because <laughs> there's no, not a lot of data in my database, but let's actually, um, let's actually go ahead and create one. Um, let's create a new report, um, so that'd be useful to see. So for those of you who haven't seen the report builder, this is a Salesforce report builder, and it should be pretty straightforward to use. Most of you probably have already built a report in Salesforce, and this is what it looks like, right? So you set filters, you first decide on what sort of report we're looking at, in this case, accounts. So we wanna see our accounts in our Salesforce instance, and then we can say, show me these fields or columns, right? Like the last activity, the account owner, name, and so on. Um, and then you can also group these various rows if you wanted to, and you can filter as well. So you can see, I wanna see all accounts in this org, not just my own, and across all time. But maybe I wanna filter out and say, current fiscal year only. See, we don't have any accounts. Um, so we will go back on that filter, but essentially that's, that's how we use the report builder. And in the background, even though you don't see this, what we're actually executing is a SQL query. So what we're telling Salesforce is I want to see accounts. Um, if I apply a filter, then I could say that were created in this year. And I want to see these fields about those accounts or this information about those accounts. So that's what's happening in the background. And this is a drag and drop interface, but you can also directly interact with the database and ask it without um, building a report. So this is a useful thing to know for admins and definitely for developers. But as an admin, you might wanna use the Salesforce developer console that you can access from here. So if you look at the cog and you, you go down there, don't be intimidated by the word developer, it's for admins as well. And this is basically an integrated environment where you can do a bunch of things like inspect code in your database, or you can just look at um, the fields that you have on different objects, for example. So let's take a look at account once again. Um, I'm gonna say open, and here I can see all of the fields on my account object. And you can do this with any object that, that you're looking at. So it's a useful analysis tool for you to take a look at what's in your Salesforce org. And you can do this on other components as well. So Apex classes and so on, triggers, pages, packages, and so on. So um, that's essentially very basic details what the dev console is. But um, a lot of people also choose to actually write code in here. You can if you want to. Um, but other developers choose to use a uh, something like Visual Studio Code. So it's not always um, the best place to do it. But what is very useful about the developer console is this query editor. And that's what we're going to look at today. So at the bottom, if you're following along in your own 
playground or something, and you've opened your developer console, you'll see I um, expanded it here, but there should be this bottom section where you can look at various things, logs, tests, and anything. But there's a, a tab for query editor. And if you don't see it, you might want to just check out the workspace settings um, where you can actually determine what which of these components on the screen is, shows up when you open it. Um, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Cool. So this is a this is a great way to get started writing queries. Where else do we use queries? Not just for ad hoc operations like I'm going to show you right now, but developers use queries in um, in classes that they write, Apex classes, triggers, a flow, a Salesforce flow uses uh, SQL queries. Once again, doesn't look like that to you because what we see, let's see if we have a flow in here, in this playground. What we see here, let's see. Okay, yeah, we have some flows, great. Let's do this basic, Oh no, I think that's an orchestrator. Never mind. Let's try cancel item flow. It's a screen flow. Um, and basically, for those of you familiar, ooh, this looks crazy. Let's try to change the layout. For those of you familiar with Flow, it's a automation tool where you can drag and drop or visually build out a um, workflow essentially um, and execute it in different contexts. Uh, this one comes with my playground. It's called Cancel Item Flow, and I assume it's with a, in an e-commerce sort of environment or meant for an e-commerce environment. Um, but here, I, what I want to show you uh, is this resource, Get Order Summary. So this is the get order re, uh, element that you can use in, in Flow. And uh, this allows you to specify what sort of records you want to see. Oh. Got something went wrong, but you see, it looks like this way you select your object and then you can filter. So, in this case, we're looking for where um, the order summary record is related to our order that started the flow, right? So, this is what's happening here. But essentially, what we're doing is just giving kind of natural language inputs for flow that goes ahead and he builds the SQL or they build the SQL query for you in the background. Um, so you, once again, you don't see the SQL query here, but that's the same thing that you're doing here as what I'll show you today. All right, I'm just going to switch and see if we have any questions so far. Um, maybe wait till the end, Taylor? Or We have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, if you'd like to do them now, we can, we can, or we can wait till the end of the session. Let's do a couple now. Sure. Yeah, let's go ahead. All right, so Aisha is asking, what basic coding language is essential to know before learning SQL? None, um, absolutely none. So um, I, I believe SQL is my first, uh, it's not per se a coding language, right? It's a, um, it's a database querying language. So it's, it's not quite the same, but it does, it's like basically inputs or commands that allow you to do something in this, in this case, query some data, right? Um, but yeah, you don't need to know anything before you get started. And I would definitely recommend, once again, that trailhead module that I referred to, it, it really starts from the beginning. Like you don't have to know anything about programming languages to get started. Awesome. Is this presentation being recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. I will share the link in Slack. If you are not on our Slack channel, I did send out an email about 15 minutes before this presentation started with a link to join our Slack community. So please make sure you are there, and then I will share it in the 07 session recordings channel. Can you open a report in the developer console so we can see the SQL behind it? Oh, I am not aware of being able to do that. I've never tried, I must say. I don't think it's one of the, no, I don't, I don't believe you can do that i think you perhaps if you are a bit more advanced if you come from a dev background perhaps if you um have a ide like visual studio code and, and you download all of your your org data um you might be able to see some details there on reports 
um, but that's a bit more advanced. We won't go through that today. Okay. Um, what is the difference between using the equal sign and like in a SQL query? Yeah, that's a great um, that's a great question. So uh, equal means exactly, and like is you know, exactly like it sounds. It's like, uh, I'm trying to think what the equivalent is in SQL. It might be like as well. Let's take a quick Google just to get the right definition. Right, I just wanna um, get you the right definitions here. So let's open up, it's always good to check the documentation. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there are various com comparative uh, comparator <laughs> um, operators in SQL, as we'll see now, as it, once it opens here. And uh, one of those is the equal sign, and another is like, right? So here we can see we have this is just equals. So basically, the expression is true if the value in the field name equals the value in the expression. So let's let's take an example here. This is actually a great way for us to get started. So let's say, um, let's query some account data. So you'll see that they even give you some, some guidance here of how to do a SQL query or construct a SQL query. But the important things to remember is that you have some required uh, words that you have here. You have select, which basically it tells Salesforce that you want to it to select some data and then you say the fields and then you say from is the other required uh, word um, and then it's the object essentially that you want to select it from and then there's some optionals that you can add on such as filtering which we'll get to in a second but let's just start with something basic so I'm going to say select name and type from account. Let's just start simple. Let's do that. I'll execute. And there we go. All right. So this is a small org. I don't have a lot of data in here, but essentially it shows us the results. We have 13 accounts in our, in our org. Here's the name and here's the type, right? So um, that's basically how it works. So now let's go back to our comparator, comparison operator, sorry. So let's start adding the equal in just to see what that looks like. So let's try to refine our search. And we say select name and type from account where, so this is where filtering comes in, type equal customer direct Taylor I'm sorry I'm hearing a bit of typing on your side if you don't mind muting just for a sec uh, thank you um, okay so let's check it out now oh, no. nothing happened oh it might be because it's a pick list. still not getting anything. Oh, okay. Oh, it might be double quotes. So this is where the live troubleshooting comes in. Nope. Um, maybe it's because it's a pick list. Let's see. Use pick list. Let's take a quick look. Sorry, guys. I'm taking you a lot of troubleshooting here today. Um, no. All right. In the meantime, let's take a look. Okay. I'm just going to switch. Let's try something else. Let's just do something simpler. So I know one of the accounts I have in my org is Edge Communications, right? So I'm just going to use that. So I'm going to say select name, type from account where name equals edge. Okay, let's try this. There we go. 
Okay, cool. So we'll go back to the pick this thing a bit later if we have time, just so that you'll know what went wrong there. But essentially, or you can pop it in the chat if you do though. Um, so we select the name type from account where the name equals edge communications, right? So um, what I'm gonna do quickly here is I'm just gonna add a, a new account real quick. And I am gonna call it Edge Telco. And we'll pretend that it's... Well, let's call it Bank, Edge Bank. Not that I think anyone would wanna bank with a company called Edge, but anyway, let's see. Feels like you're on the precipice of something. But anyway, so we have a new account that we've added and it's called Edge Bank. And so now where the light comes in, Let's quickly look at this. Here is our like operator. And this essentially tells us that the expression is true if the value in the field name matches the characters of the text string in the specified value. All right. So it's single quotes. Um, and the it's supported, like is only supported for string fields, right? So it will match partial text strings and include support for um, kind of wild cards. So these wild cards are percentage. This is a bit more complex. We want, might not get into it. Um, so this will match zero or more characters and underscore will match exactly one character. So what that will look like here, let's take a look at this one. Select account ID, first name and last name from contact where the last name is like Apple. Okay. So this will return contacts with the last name Appleton, Apple, and Apple, but not Bapple, for example, right? Because the, the wild card is at the end there, okay? So essentially what we use like for is if we don't know for sure exactly what we're looking for. So let's try, actually, let's try this. Okay, so it won't work here, but let's do, uh, let's maybe spell it in lowercase. And then it pops up, right? So essentially what the like allows you to do is to account for human error when it comes to text values, right? So, uh, you know, different people might capitalize or may not capitalize. There might be slightly different spellings and that's where you can start refining, sorry, refining your um, like search with these wild cards to say it matches exactly one character or zero or more characters, right? So you can use this to refine your search or if you just use it as is, it'll, it'll work like this where it ignores the um, capitalization, for example. Let's see if it ignores, I don't think it ignores special characters. No, so it's just essentially the case that it will ignore when you use like here. Whereas if I used an equal now, I probably won't get anything. Oh, it still shows up. Okay, never mind. Um, so the, the short answer is, sorry, I, I think I've confused more and then I would have here, but it is essentially where like allows you to, when you don't have the full value that you're looking for, you can do either one character that it matches or that is changes the wild card, or it could do zero or more characters. But let me um, get a better example for you. Um, and I'll pop it in the Slack channel. Sorry if I've confused more now <laughs> than anything, um, but it's a good question. Uh, so we can come back to that later as well. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do a few more examples and then we can get back to some other questions now. Um, what I wanted to go through a bit now is to look at some of the other, uh, elements of a SQL query. So now we know we have to have these two select and from those are required, right? Uh, and what we also can do is add some filtering conditions where we say where. So this is basically, I only wanna see accounts that match a certain criteria and, and so on. So this is where you can filter and you can 
you can start, you know, like getting quite um, low level with your filtering, uh, which is actually good. The more filtering you apply, especially in an org where you have realistic volumes of data, so like in the thousands or millions, you really want to have very, we call them selective queries. Um, so we filter out only, literally only the records that we need because um, otherwise you're going to get a lot of results. And there are some limitations in Salesforce around how many queries you can run, how many results you can get per query. Um, so you do want to make it as selective as possible because the less selective it is, the, less, uh, the longer it'll take to actually run that query and it'll slow down your system performance, right? Right, so <clears throat> um, what I wanted to add here is now an additional filter criteria, but I don't want to work with accounts anymore. I don't have a lot of detail. Um, let's actually see quickly what accounts we have here. Um, let's say... Uh, Okay, let's do um, something like this. Okay. Let's say select name and type some account where um, the, no, actually, I'm going to try something else, sorry. Let's do select name, type, and this field is annual revenue. And remember, if you don't recall the actual API field names, because it's important to have that correct, um, otherwise you're going to get some errors in your query, you can always go back here and check out the field names, right? So let's see, annual revenue, that seems correct. Um, and essentially what we're looking at here, we want the annual revenue from account where... Let's do this again. Annual revenue is, let's say, bigger than. So uh, my org is a South African org, so it's in rands. Uh, South African rand is our currency. So I'm just going to say, let's say where the revenue is bigger than a million. And then here comes and, which is a way that you can combine filter criteria. Is smaller than, let's see here. Um, let's do okay. So essentially, this will allow us to actually have more refined criteria for our searches. So for example, if I quickly wanted to see which of our accounts fall within a specific range of annual revenue, I can perform a query like this, combine um, specific query values. Uh, and here we have, we can quickly get those three accounts that fall in that range. Or the other option is to use the OR operator so now instead of looking for both of those uh, things to be true, you can have one or the other. So let's say the annual revenue is either larger than a million or let's see if we can find another, or let's use employees. Or employees is larger than 2,000. Okay, let's try that. Mm -hmm. Okay, you see the error that we got here? There's no such, let me just try to execute that again so you can see. Oh, it's not going to come up again. But essentially, um, the error that I got is that it's saying there's no such field like employees. So it means that I must have my API um, uh, name wrong. And indeed, there you can see the API name is actually number of employees and not just employees. So let's go back here. Go number of employees. 
and we execute, and there we go. Uh, maybe you want to add actually that field in our list view so we can see. And there we can see also the number of employees. Um, and we can then in this way manually check that actually all of this makes sense. So for example, Dickinson PLC only has 120 employees, but they're definitely above the annual revenue of 1 million. So that's how we can use and and or operators as well in our filtering criteria. And then um, another thing that you might wanna do, especially if you have a long list of results coming from your query, is you might want to sort it in a certain way. So for example, if I have to quickly look at this, maybe I want to see um, you know, my top priority client at the very top of this list. So I can say, let's order this. And this gives us the, another um, keyword that we're using, which is order. Uh, oh, sorry. Order by. So you have to say which field you want to order by. And let's say annual revenue is the one I want to like take a look at. And then you can also, oh, let's try that first. There we go. So you'll see that it orders my list now. Um, and this is the same thing that happens in a report when you sort or order by a specific column in that report, right? Um, so it orders starting with, you know, uh, it's going ascending here, so lowest to highest. But I can also change this if I want to see my top performer at the top of the list, then I can use the keyword DESC, which stands for descending or alternatively ascending. Right? No, that's not right. <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't remember exactly the keyword, but... Um, a is it's just ASC, I think. But this will change the um, the list view. However, you can see that there is um, they still have the null values at at the top, and there is a way around this. I wonder if I, I had it open earlier. I think it might be in this actually. Let's try this uh, module um, or maybe not no it's not in here anyway there is a way to remove the nulls or to say nulls first i think it might be just the order by annual revenue i'm just guessing now guys i might be wrong oh no that there it is um so i think i still need the descending keyword. There we go. Finally, <laughs> I got it right. So you see now that all the keywords that I've added here is order by this field, descending. So start with the highest value, but also put all of the fields that have no value in them, put them at the end. I don't want to see them at the top. All right. So I hope that that's clear. And I hope that this me struggling through this also helps you all. The one thing to remember with SQL queries, as in Apex, um, and as in any programming that you ever do, um, you're always going to be referencing documentation, or you might have tools and plugins in your developer environment that help you do all of this. So no one's ever going to know all of this from the top of their head. You're always going to go back and reference things. And you know, Google's your best friend. It's, it's a very easy, quick search on anything. Cool. So let's let's maybe take one or two more questions for now, Taylor, before we go on to some final yeah. aggregate queries. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, Nicole is asking, do you have to write the SQL commands in a certain order, um, like always select first and then from and then where and then like? Yes. Um, yes, you do have to do it in that order when it comes to these um, keywords. So these two are um, are required, as I mentioned before. And you can see that they follow, it's actually like a story, right? You're saying, give me this, this, and this from this object where, you know, so it's like, it's logical the way that it um, follows. So it's always gonna be select, then from, 
um, and then where. But then after that, you know, when it comes to your um, various filter criteria, it becomes less important how you order that. Um, but you do want to finish with your filter criteria, the where part of your clause, essentially, before you get to order by, for example. So the best thing to do here is to look at the documentation and check out some examples. But essentially, the answer is, is yes. OK, and then a similar follow-up question. Do we need to end our coding with um, the, oh, what is that in my head? Uh, symbol <laughs> in the query editor. Semicolon. Yeah, semicolon, yeah. that's right. I'm like, it's not a colon. It's not, a, it's not. but go ahead. Yes, it's <laughs> Yeah, um, no, you don't have to. Uh, so this is something that you'll see in code, uh, in most languages of code, um, definitely in Apex code, is um, that you end off your uh, your line with the semicolon or the end of your, basically your expression. That's not necessary in the SQL editor. OK. Um... When should we utilize SQL or SQL for querying data within the data cloud environment? Oh, that's interesting. I actually haven't played around with this before. Um, so it will be similar in data cloud where you will want to search for something within your environment. I'm guessing the like high volumes of data that you'll have in data cloud is that you'll have to have lot, a lot more restrictive or selective queries that you're using. Um, and I believe it probably would be more SQL than, I mean, SQL than SQL and Data Cloud, but I'm not 100% sure. It is still on the Salesforce architecture, so that's a good question. Um, I can follow up in Slack there, but I think the thing to know about Data Cloud as well is that there's also kind of visual interfaces for doing this, uh, like building queries and so on. But in the back, it's still something very similar to what you see here. OK. Uh, how do you handle governor limits when writing SQL queries? Yeah, great question. So let's actually take a look at that. Oh my gosh. So for those of you who um, don't know what this is referring to, is that you have some entitlements uh, and limits within Salesforce. And that's because everyone's on the same you know, environment. They have the different instances. But we're using the same infrastructure, right? So there are certain limitations that apply to everyone um, so that we don't, you know, uh, degrade the performance of anyone's instance. So uh, let's just take a look at what these limits are. So here, um, Salesforce Band, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you do, a great blog resource to take a look at. But here's some of the limits uh, summarized for you. So you have a 100,000 character limit for the entire query. So it means that like literally every um, every letter and every space, every character that you have, it, it can't be more than 100,000. I don't think I've ever hit that query, I mean that limit. Um, but that's something to keep in mind and there's not really any workaround other than trying to be as succinct with how you query. Um, and then you also have some other character limits. I'm not going to go into this too much detail. You can go look at this. It's for very complex um, queries. And then there's uh, no more than 55 child to parent relationships. And what we mean, I'm just going to quickly actually show you, and I think there should be on here, a child to parent relationship is where you actually want to um, get like information about a child object, like contact in this case, but also you want to get information about its parent object, the account. So you know that in Salesforce, the contact is related to an account. Um, and you can do this by essentially using dot notation as we call here. So you'd say select ID account dot. So that means we're 
traversing, we're going up a relationship name. And then you can also, you'll see here's a great example of where it tells you how to deal with custom objects as well. You know, account just is has no um, suffix, but a custom object will have the underscore underscore C behind it, right? And in a SQL query, you actually change that C to an R because it's referring to the relationship. Um, but that's similar except for that part, the R that changes from the C, but you'd still use the dot notation to get the value. And then you can say still from contact and you can even use the um, parent information in your where clause, as you can see here. But so essentially what it's saying is no more than 55 child to parent relationships in one query. So you can't reference, say, I don't know if that will ever be the case, but say you have 60 lookup uh, fields on your contact, you can't reference each and every one of them in your query, you'll get a, a limit there. Then there's some other ones here, um, some common ones. Uh, there's also parent to child. We can take a look at that now. 120 second timeout. So if your query is too long or not selective enough, it's taking too long to get the records. Um, you will get your timeout error. And then there's also uh, a couple of other things when you use SQL in transactions, which can be an Apex class or trigger. It could be a flow. It could be another type of transaction. Um, you can only have 100 queries in a synchronous transaction. So that means it happens at the same time. So for example, I have an Apex trigger and, and it's before save of our, or after save, and there's no kind of later path, asynchronous path. And then I can only have a maximum of 100 queries, a maximum of 200 for asynchronous. So anything, you know, maybe in flow, you've seen that you can run the flow immediately or, or run it later that's asynchronous. And then also a maximum of 50,000 rows returned per transaction. So if you're gonna look at more, if you're gonna expect more than 50,000 records to be returned in your query, you're gonna have to look at ways to split that up. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. In, in Apex, you can actually, you know, like kind of just say, uh, we call it a for loop. So um, while, uh, your total collection is less than 50,000, keep querying or, or you know, continue on after that, um, basically breaking up the transactions. So it's separate transactions. And the same thing you can do in flow where, let's go back here, oh, here, where you can basically just have a decision element to see how many records have you queried um, and then use a wait element, which essentially creates a new transaction in that flow as well. So that's, that's how you can circumvent some of those limitations. Um, and the other th important thing to know is that in your SQL queries, uh, you should never use, or not in your SQL queries, you should never use a SQL query inside a loop in Apex, for those of you who have a bit of development background. And that's because it'll you'll start to hit, um, for every time that a uh, query is called, it counts as one of these 100 queries that you have, right? So if you have a SQL query in a loop and you're processing maybe a thousand records, it's gonna run a thousand queries and you'll definitely hit that transaction. So you always wanna have your SQL query outside of your loop and you can do that by creating a list. I don't think we have some time to, to demonstrate that today, but I'll, I'll find some resources and, and post it in Slack for those of you who are interested. Awesome. That's great, Azel. Do you want me to continue with some more? We have a lot of questions in the Q&A and we only have a, a handful of minutes left. Yeah, let, let's continue with the questions. Okay, cool. Um, Diana is asking, is there a benefit of using Salesforce Inspector over the developer console when creating queries? I'm not sure. I think it comes down to um, personal preference, to be honest. I don't use Inspector that much. I know that they've kind of uh, relaunched a while ago and there's a lot of more features. So it's worth checking out, but I haven't used it in a while. So maybe give us a shout in the chat if you prefer using it or if there's any other added benefits. But I think it, it comes down to preference. 
All right. Um, Sheldon is asking, can you give any practical use cases of when an admin would use SQL instead of simply pulling a report? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I find it's easy, it's quicker for me to do a quick SQL query in the Dev Console than building a report, but um, maybe for other folks it isn't. So it's once again your comfort level with things, what you prefer to do. Um, the other thing is, in the past, you could actually, uh, well, you can still do it. You can actually make updates to the, the rows in the Dev Console. Whereas you, you couldn't do inline editing and reports, but now you can do that too. So um, I can't think of a lot of reasons why an admin would use this over a report, uh, unless it's quicker, as for me. Um, but it becomes really important. To, it's a good skill to have, even to read code in your org. Um, even if you're not building code yourself, it helps to know how the queries work. So when you read code, you understand actually what data are we working with here? So I think that's useful for an admin. Awesome. Uh, can you quickly show us how to use Query Locator for large data sets? Um, <laughs> so that's a bit more of a... a a complex question, right? Um, I would rather get you an example and pop it in the, the chat. But yeah, I don't think we're going to have time to go through that now. We only have a minute left. Sorry about that. Yeah, OK. Um, let's see. Can you explain a little bit about bringing child details into a single query while we fetch data from the parent object using parentheses? Yeah, I'll just um, I have time to quickly show you this. Uh, Salesforce Ben article, but this is what, let's quickly find the parent to child. So this is the other way around. So from the account, I want to select um, some details from the account record, but also a list of contacts related to that account. So what that looks like is select ID name from account, essentially it's a query, but then we have the sub query in here in parentheses that say select ID and name from contact. So then it will go and look for all the contacts related to the accounts that it's returning and also give you a list of those contacts as well and the information you asked for. Okay, I think we've got another question. Is, uh, is it possible to alias field names to an easier to remember name such as number of employees to just employees? You can do that in Apex. You can't do it in, in, in a SQL query editor. Okay. Uh, I think we've got two more questions here. Um, has SQL evolved uh, or remained static since uh, Dreamforce 2018? Good question. Um, so the SQL itself, there has been some improvements um, over the years, small things like um, expanding the operators that's available and so on, but not major changes. It's, it's basically the same thing. It's basically just like SQL for Salesforce, right? But now with generative AI and Einstein Copilot that's coming in, you're going to see um, much more people not having to use SQL, for example. You're just going to use natural language. You're just going to say to Einstein um, Copilot, you're just going to say, get me all of these records where the revenue is this or this. Um, so it's basically, once again, a tool that does the SQL querying in the background for you, but it's just more accessible to everyone. OK. And uh, last question. I think this box makes it a little bit hard to see, but I will read it. Um, is Schema Builder the primary tool for visualizing the Salesforce data model diagram, or there are alternative methods like SQL queries to achieve the same? Sorry. 
can you hear me? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. okay. So um, schema builder is the primary tool within your Salesforce instance itself. Yes. Um, SQL queries won't give you uh, essentially the form of your database or the data model. It'll be much too complex <laughs> or essentially you can write out your data model, but that's not going to help you in this case. There are other tools such as Lucidchart, for example, in their enterprise plan where you can actually import um, your sales. You just connect to Salesforce and it imports um, and visualizes your data model. And I believe there's a couple of other tools on App Exchange in the market that can do that for you. A SQL query. Okay, um, I think that's all the questions in the Q&A. Uh, Michelle in the chat is asking, can Copilot Einstein code queries? Zell, we're having trouble with your internet today. Um, Sorry, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, it can. All right. Well, that's going to be it. We've got all the questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Coach Giselle, um, for your help here today. I think this was a super useful session for everyone. I'm seeing all the emojis flying on the bottom, so I think it was very informative. And if you missed anything, um, these are recorded, guys. So I will take this today, um, get it uploaded onto our website, and share that in Slack. If you are not in Slack, you should be there because that's where we share all the recordings. I did send a link via email earlier to join our Slack community. If you are not there yet, get over there. Um, and we will see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye.